Welcome to a Scottish election special with myself, Declan McConville and Patrick McGilp. Um, we are the State of Politics and we're going to be talking you through um, our predictions for the election, where we think the key places are, where the election could be won, where it could be lost and how we think parties are going to get on. So, first of all, kick off. Patrick, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, Declan? I'm fine. We're a wee bit soaked. Um, we're through here um, and I've got a wee bit soaked in the way here, but we're all good. So... Patrick, this is a big week. It's a big week that defines probably the next five years in Scotland after COVID. It defines a constitutional question in Scotland, probably. This election, so so first of all, where, where do you want to start with? Well, I mean, just about every party's calling it the biggest election since devolution. You've got the Greens saying vote on how your future depends on it. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon saying we could be independent by the end of the Parliament. Uh, and then the Unionist Party's focusing on the recovery. So there's a lot to t- uh, discuss. There is. So, we'll start on the SNP, the part of the government. They've went with an election tactic of stable leadership. Obviously, Nicola Sturgeon's been the person. We read an article during the week saying that she's not had a day off during the, the past year. Do you think that election tack is going to fare them in, in good stale? Obviously, Nicola's been in charge of the, the country for seven years. Or, or do you think the Scottish people might want a bit of freshness in the parliament? Well, the polls don't show that. Mm-hmm. Um they're solidly sort of 50% in the constituencies and 40% on the list. Uh, she's the most popular politician in Scotland, if not the United Kingdom. So I think they're definitely going to win the election. It's just whether or not they get a, a majority or a minority. Uh, so yeah, I can see a, an easy SNP victory. Okay, so if you think that, do you think the constituency seats are going to be important or the, the, the list seats? And again, important to kind of differentiate the two, obviously, the, the constituency seats that... that we, we know ourselves are basically who you want to represent your area and your list seats and who your party in government. So we've got a lot of different parties in the list. Um, who, who do you see being the big winners of the list, first of all? <sighs> Everyone apart from the SNP. Obviously the, the, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, that's where the bulk of their seats come from. So they're going to be the main winners, but you've also got the Lib Dems sort of, uh, in Perth and in the, the islands, Shetland and Orkney. Uh, obviously the Alba Party have emerged. Uh, I can't see them getting a seat, hopefully not anyway. I don't know, I mean Alex Salmon, you know, he's quite a big character, but again, what was the the, the stat you showed me on the way through here about his um, approval ratings at this point? I think it was net minus 70%, which is uh, down there with the coronavirus. Yeah, it's not very popular, so no. um, I don't know how Alba's going to fare in this election. I, I don't think they'll do well myself. I know there's a lot of big personalities standing for him, obviously former First Minister Alex Salmon, Kenny McCaskill, former Justice Secretary. Um, but I just don't see them making a breakthrough. Uh, well, Alex might break through in uh, North East Scotland. Uh, I think he needs to get something like just over 10,000 votes, over 5%, because they're not standing on the constituencies. I think that's certainly possible. I don't know if it's probable. Uh, I can't see them making a breakthrough anywhere else. Why Why do you think, I know we've spoken to a lot of guests over the past week, that We've got a party like this when a lot of people would say that the SNP are the party that can achieve independence. Why do you think Alex Salmon's wanted to form a a separate party? Is it just to play the election system, as in play the the system that we've got in play because he knows that the SNP, as you already rightly pointed out, don't have a chance on the list? Or is it for personal gain and it's because, you know, we've heard a lot about independence hasn't happened sooner. Do, do you, what, what one of the two do you think it really is? Well, I don't think the SNP stand no chance on the list. I mean, uh, I think they've got two list MSPs in south of Scotland. I think they maybe stand a chance in the Highlands and Islands mm. because obviously the Lib Dems control Orkney and Shetland. Uh, I don't think any other party would have Alex Salmon, to be perfectly honest, after the behaviour that he admitted to mm. in court, where he was found innocent, but the behaviour was disgusting, as we've spoken about. Mm. Uh, so I think he's had to set up this party and it's it's more of a vehicle for himself as opposed to a sort of serious political party. I think if he fails to get in this time, it could quite easily fade over the coming months with infighting and all the other, all the rest. But where do you think a party like Alaba would, would go if they, they don't make a break from this election? Obviously, with a lot of deflections from the SNP back to, to the new party in Alaba, but do, do you think those people would go back or...? Do you think they would continue to, to go on this road of a different independence party? I, I can't see them being allowed back, to be perfectly honest. I think, you know, what Alba stands for, uh, some of their social policies, obviously their leader, there doesn't seem to be a structure there either. It's very thrown together at the last minute. Uh, 
the people who have left, I think there's a process in the SNP where you need, where you need to wait about a year and then you need to be assessed by H HQ. So I can't see them returning to the SNP or the Greens or wherever they came from. I think they might end up in this sort of political wilderness uh, if Alba does fold, which I think it will if they don't gain representation. So it should be interesting seeing their probable collapse in the next year or two. We were talking about big personalities in Scottish politics and talked about the list. We've got George Galloway's return to Scottish politics. Um, George is a figure I think we all know. He's you know probably more for his appearance in Celebrity Big Brother rather than, than British politics. Why do you think George is back? Because he loves George. Uh, George loves himself. He loves being in the spotlight. Obviously his uh, Sputnik TV show on Russia Today uh, wasn't enough for him. He wasn't getting enough attention. He's, uh, I think he's still the leader of the Socialist Workers' Party. I think he's still the leader of Respect uh, and his other uh, sort of diddy parties that he leads that don't get any representation. Uh, I can't see that being uh, something that's spoken about widely after the election. I think that's going to uh, wilt pretty pathetically uh, after election day. I can't see any of them getting any hope in hell of getting a seat. Do you think George would, would come back? another time or do you think after this that'll be it or you know George obviously seven years ago very strongly defended the union um, if we are to have another referendum would you expect him again to be to be heavily involved in that campaign oh definitely I mean if anyway George can sort of shove himself into the spotlight George will manage it uh, with, uh, with his hat his fedora uh, mad hat <laughs> mad hatter uh, Yes, hopefully there is another independence referendum. The polls are sort of split just now and there's probably going to be a mandate for it in the next parliament. Uh, but yeah, George will try and force his way onto any sort of TV, camera, stage, studio, whatever. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll, we'll be hearing a lot from George as long as George is able to speak. Yeah, it's going to be a big battle, I think. Uh, a big battle of the heavyweights, a lot of people were seeing. But one of the parties that are going under the radar who look to be doing very well in the polls... Are the Greens once again now? We've had Lorna Slater and we've had Kate Nevins in the podcast in the past couple of weeks. What do you think the Greens' chances are on the list in this election? On the list, very positive. Even uh, in your constituency, of Glasgow yeah, Kelvin, he's he's in with a chance. Yeah, I don't know if he he's. Is. I don't know how how big a chance he's in with, but he's certainly in with a chance. Uh, obviously, a DSMP candidate, Cole Cab Stewart, on as well. Yeah, I mean, most polls are predicting them to get double figures both in percentages and in seats. So I think it's quite likely that we could see them even double their tally in the next parliament. Uh, obviously a pro-independence voice, a sort of left of centre voice. Uh, so yeah, it's looking good for the, the Green Party and I think they'll get both of their co-leaders uh, as MSPs for the first time. Just, just before we, we go on to continue chatting, if you're, you're watching us live here, we've got a couple of comments coming in. Please give us your thoughts. Where do you think the election will be won? What do you think is going to happen? Um, obviously, we won't get the results right away on Thursday like we would traditionally due to COVID, but we are probably on Friday going to get a very good picture of what this parliament is going to be like. So please do get involved in the, the comments and, and let us know your thoughts. So as you were mentioning there, the Greens, the possible two co-leaders will get elected to the parliament. Um, the Greens not just breaking through in Scotland, we don't think possibly a breakthrough in Germany as well? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I think they've got an election in early October and uh, they've all released, uh, all the German parties have released their uh, cand uh, candidate for Chancellor. And since that's happened, the Greens have just overtaken the CDU, which has been the most popular party in Germany since it became a democracy. Uh, Yes, I think they'll do well in October. Whether they end up the largest party remains to be seen. It's very neck and neck. It's about 25-26% for both of them. Uh, I can certainly see them being part of government. I don't think... I think they've got on quite well with the CDU. That's the, the European way. Parties working together. Uh, so it's looking good for them. Obviously, 2019 general election. Caroline Lucas's England and Wales Green Party get 800,000 votes. I think they should have got about 18 seats for that, but they only get one. Shows you the broken Westminster electoral system. Uh, but yeah, they're on their eyes all across Europe. Yeah, they certainly are, and it's going to be interesting. Um, I think certainly in the position that we're in just now as a world, in terms of climate change and whatnot, that I think it is a very a big positive to have green voices in the parliament. Yeah, definitely, and I forgot to mention they've actually in the uh, London mayoral election. I think the Greens are polling in third on about eight percent. I'm not don't quote me on that. I'm not entirely sure, but I think they're they're certainly uh, punched above their weight. They're level with the Lib Dems. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so yeah, a green rise across the world, it would seem. Yeah, it would appear so, and it's going to be interesting to see how the Greens get on. So we've covered now Alaba, Alliance for Unity, the Greens, and the list. Any other parties who you think the list could um, benefit? Well, I think the SNP are pushing both votes. The SNP so they're looking to get a few on the list to sort of nudge them over the line for a majority. Uh, the Labour Party could end up with all of their MSPs on the list this time round, with uh, East Lothian, I think it's Edinburgh Southern and uh, Dumbarton, all very close. So yeah, it's all to play for for most parties, but I think uh, it, it's certainly the Greens that will come out as winners for the list mm-hmm. in this election. So, I've covered that. Um, another party on the list that, you know, fared fairly well in 2016 with the Tories. Um, this election... They've got a different leader this time around, of course, and our linesman. You wouldn't think so with the uh, leaflets that have been going well, through the this door? this is very true. Ruth seems to be the poster girl um, for that, but uh, Dougie Ross leading the Tories. We saw a very interesting poster yesterday that said if the SNP win a majority, it will mean a second independence referendum. Now, the Tory party and Boris Johnson have certainly been saying that there's going to be no independence referendum. Do, do you think that the reason why the Tories keep on talking about independence referendums is because they're scared there's going to be another one. Definitely. I mean, if they were confident of another no vote, which would kill independence for a generation, if not many generations, Mm -hmm. if they were confident of a no vote, they would let us have one, like they did in 2012, when independence was only popular with a third of the population. I think they're going for the um, a a second... uh, Independence referendum is inevitable with an SNP majority. They're putting all their eggs in one basket. I think they're, they think the SNP won't get a majority. Uh, so it, it should be interesting to see if that backfires or not. I can certainly see the Tories going backwards. There's no way they'll hold on to their 31 seats. Uh, so yeah, it should, be, it should be interesting for the Tory party. Hopefully slide back into third where they belong. majority of our viewers so far are saying they're going to be voting SNP. We've got a guy here... He was telling us that he's voting SNP for the first time and he's voting for the Socialist Party with his second vote, which again shows the um, the way the electoral system works. So you've obviously got your two votes in your um, your constituency seat and then the, the list vote. And again, it's good for a political system to have a lot of different parties. Yeah, I mean, a lot of options. It's, it's extremely hard to break through with the first-past-the-post system. I think... Uh, Obviously, we've left now, but the United Kingdom, Westminster, was o- was the only system that used first past the post. Mm-hmm. France comes close; they go to a second round, but you know it's just it's such a backwards electoral system. And you say the second uh, the second vote, the last vote is a is for your party of government. That's certainly how the SNP would frame it because yes. they're the only candidate for government. Yep. But it gives you this option where you've got the region of Glasgow, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, they can vote, and they only need five percent to get an MSP, and you saw in 2003, I think it was uh, the the Pensioners Party, yes. I think uh-huh. the Scottish Socialist Party get quite a number of MP, MSPs, I think the Greens might have got seven in that election, so, so it shows you... The yeah, Rainbow for Parliament they called that? The Rainbow Parliament, indeed. Uh, yes, um, so it is for the party of government, but you can see these small parties break through, and that's the benefit of having an additional member system. 100%. Um, we were talking about the Tories there, and, you know, we've said that leadership change... If the Tories, you know, lose seats in this election, does does Douglas Ross continue to pursue himself as Conservative leader? Because, and the reason I ask the question is, he's already an MP, still is, but he obviously Neil Gray, the, the MP for Airdrie Shot, stood down because he was going to contest for Holyrood. Douglas Ross hasn't. Um, with no actually guarantee of winning his seat. He's not even standing in the constituency, he's standing in the list. Um if he loses, because again, he said that he'll continue to be a linesman, do you still see him being Conservative leader? I mean, if he doesn't get in on the list, I mean, that's a monumental failure and he can't survive that. If he gets in on the list and the party go backwards, I think it's the extent to which they go backwards, I think it's the same for Anna Sarwar, actually. I think the Tories win about 15 or 16 seats and then in 2016 they doubled that to 31. If they were to go back to the 15 or 16, I think it would be very, very difficult for Douglas Ross to hold on to the Conservative leadership. I think if Anna Sarwar was to go, I think they're in 24 just now, if they were to go below 15 or 16, I think it would be very difficult for him to hold on. I actually don't think either of those things are going to happen. I think they'll both continue beyond the election. I think they'll have marginal losses, both the parties. Labour might even make gains. But uh, yeah, he, he's taken over at a bad time, I suppose. Anyone who who's going to follow with Davidson, you saw 
Jackson Carlin his eye because he wasn't making headway. Uh, it was a tough act to follow, um, and I think for you know that that was the best result that they had in about thirty years in Scotland under Ruth Davidson in twenty seventeen, the general election. Uh, so I think they they could be in the wilderness. They could be sliding backwards for the next ten fifteen years. The Conservatives. Do you think that if um, Ruth wasn't going to the Lords and had continued on as Conservative leader? they'd be having a lot more positive campaign because obviously it's been a big stick that Nicola Sturgeon's been able to hit her with that she's not contesting this election. So any time we saw Ruth Davison challenge Nicola Sturgeon in Parliament, you know, it was a bit tongue-in-cheek because she, inevitably she wasn't going to be putting herself to the people of Scotland. So why should she have the right to then the question that the First Minister who was putting herself up for election? Yeah, um, it's it, it's a, it's an easy... Uh, stick for the SNP to beat the, the Conservatives with, the House of Lords, only party in Scotland in favour of the House of Lords, the Conservatives. Uh, she, she's a much better oppositional leader, probably the best opposition leader that, uh, that the Scottish Parliament has had in the 14 years of SNP government. Uh, I wouldn't say Nicola Sturgeon has struggled to deal with her, she's certainly had difficult days, um, but Douglas Ross is just nowhere near the, the, the calibre of Ruth Davidson uh, and I think Jackson Carlow was the same that's shown they've they've struggled uh, they've really struggled and I think that's why she's on the election uh, the election literature yes, yep. uh, because they trust her so much and she's obviously a figure if you look at what the Tories have actually managed to do in Scotland in the past 10 years you know I mean to say to any Scottish voter probably when the parliament was created at one point the Tories would become the official opposition and get more seats in the Scottish Labour people would have been absolutely bemused at that. Yeah, it would be hard to believe. I mean, when you look at the, the first um, Scottish government, I think Labour were on 55 and the Lib Dems were about 15-ish. So I think it was a coalition government of about 70. And when you look at the 2016 election result, I think Labour were on 24 and the Lib Dems were on 5, so that's 29. So that coalition, the first very, the very first Scottish government combined had less seats than the Conservatives, 17 years on in Scottish politics, and you, no one, no one would have seen that coming. Yep. We were on that um, topic. Get Daniel coming in here saying that it will vote SNP until we get independence, and it's back to Labour. Do you think that's the same case for a lot of voters in Scotland at this point in time? I think that's probably what people have in their heads. You know, you, I don't think you can predict where the Labour Party will be uh, whenever Scotland becomes independent. If Scotland becomes independent, I think it probably is inevitable. It's just how quickly it happens. It could happen in four years, it could happen in 40. Uh, but I think it is inevitable. Where the Labour Party are in that time, you know, if they go backwards in this election again, they've only got 16,500 members now. They're, they're, I think they're going to take losses in the local elections in England as well. It's They're a shrinking force all over the UK, really. And with Anna Sarwar, if he doesn't make ele electoral gains this time, there's three years until a general election. There's another five years to a Scottish election. What he can do in that time, I think, will be vital because I think Scotland will be very close to independence by that point. You don't know what the SNP could look like in that time. You don't know who could uh, take over as leader. You know, I think Joanna Sherry uh, would quite like to be leader. You don't know what, the, what direction the party could take if she was in charge, uh, promising people like Hamza Yousaf and Kate Forbes, you don't know how the electorate would fare with them. So I think it's very hard to predict beyond uh, beyond independence because it's such a massive event and very few parties arguing for unity after a country breaks away, I think, survive. So it'll be, it'll be a very different landscape, I think, after Scotland becomes independent. In terms of Scottish Labour's position, do you think that so far in this election that they are that they're managing to pull people back because we've saw Anna Sarwar use the line that he wants to talk about real policies but during the, the Channel 4 news debate you know, he was asked do you want to just sit out of this one because it seems that you know, out of the three biggest parties in Scotland the ACMP are the pro-independence party the Tories are the, the pro-union party and Labour's just lost in the middle Not only that I mean, I think Nicola Sturgeon's the only one that actually believes and is campaigning on being the party of government uh, uh, obviously the Conservatives are trying to stop the SNP, get as many seats as they can uh, and be the main party of opposition and as Sarwar says we deserve a better opposition, uh, the Greens and the Lib Dems obviously aren't in a position to become the government, the largest party and yeah, uh, the Tories have, 
uh, have won the hardline unionist vote. So it's it's very difficult to see where the electoral coalition become uh, comes from for Anna Sarwa. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, they're focusing on the national recovery. They say they want to move on from the old politics, but he can't dictate to the electorate what the electorate want. Mm. If forty to fifty percent want another referendum, he can't say, "Oh, I want to move on," because he's not going to win votes doing that. No. He's he's going to alienate that fifty percent of people. And though, though that fifty percent of people have held firm with the SNP for seven years now, and they don't appear to be moving. No, we've got Feed the Bear coming in saying Labour's rebuild is massive. Vote SNP for independence. How do you think Labour do rebuild? Because they've just rightly pointed out there at this point in time, they're a party that do seem a bit lost. That they're not clearly again defining their, their position in constitutional questions. We saw how that's came to to haunt them in, in general elections, especially. The last general election when, when Jeremy Corbyn, although he put forward a very progressive manifesto, was rejected by the people of England because of the, their stance in Brexit and not gaining a position. On the Scottish constitutional question, failure to again take a position or again join forces with the Tory, Tories, I think would be very damaging for Scottish Labour. So how do you think that they rebuild as a party in Scotland? Do you think this election could... Could give them something to rebuild upon, or do you think this could another be another thing to hamper them? Well, the election presents the opportunity, doesn't it? They could they could lose seats and still overtake the Tories and finish second. They could gain seats and finish third. They could gain seats and finish second. You just don't know how it's going to go. I mean, the rebuild is so massive that it's actually looking worse than Celtic's rebuild. Yeah. It, it, it really is sure that bad. Sure, the better <laughs> in that one too. Yep. They, they do not want Peter Lawwell anywhere near that rebuild. Um, but yeah. Uh, Minimal losses or even standing still, maybe one or two gains, I think would be an exceptional result for the Labour Party. They've never made gains in a Scottish elections. The Liberal Democrats are the same. Uh, so to to reverse that trend of, I think, 22 years now would be, would be a massive feat. Obviously, they're starting from a very low bar, but it would be a massive, massive achievement. We've got Kevin Graham coming in, um, another Axon contributor like myself. He said the SNP need held to account and not by the Conservative Party who are a one message party. Labour are the only party that can do this, Sarwar, is impressive. I would certainly agree with that, that I think in terms of party leader anyway, that Anna Sarwar is doing a lot better job at the moment than Douglas Ross. And that I think in terms of what Scottish politics are, you would prefer a party that's more central left challenging the SNP rather than the Tories as the main opposition party. Yeah, definitely. When it comes to the budget, obviously the Tories will talk about how they haven't cut taxes, whereas Labour will criticise them for not raising taxes. Yeah. They're sort of caught in the middle in the SNP. So I think the vast majority, 75 to 80%, will vote for centre or centre-left parties. The The Conservative Party are limited in the number of votes they, get, they can get because they're so poisonous here in Scotland. So they've, they've really got a ceiling, whereas the Labour Party could definitely be government in five, ten years' time. So to have them as the official opposition, where they can actually be viewed as an alternative government, and Asawa, as you were saying, has made an impressive start. His, uh, his leader rating is just below Nicola Sturgeon, which, which is incredibly impressive. Um, so, yeah, having them as a... I don't think the Tories would ever be in government in Scotland. I, I just can't see that happening. can't see that. I would hope that wouldn't happen. Yeah. Um, but I, I think Kevin's spot on there in terms of the Tories being a one-message party. I mean... Whether we agree or don't agree with Anna Sama, there's policies there for a COVID recovery and, you know, whether his position in the constitutional question is a bit flawed, <coughs> you know, he has a recovery plan, he wants to invest money into the NHS, he wants to build more houses, we had Sarah Boy out in the podcast and, uh, again, she was talking about a green recovery, so we are seeing Labour come across with very progressive policies that, you know, would stand the country in good stead. Well, there is consensus on needing to build uh, more homes, uh, I think... Labour's promise of, uh, I think they're promising 100,000 homes for social rent. SNP are promising 100,000 homes, 70% for social rent. So there's consensus on there. That should get through. The National Care Service seems to be over the pandemic with the, the care home deaths. Uh, obviously, that's that's been sprung into the spotlight. There's consensus on that. So the real, there, there's real agreement. There's obviously disagreement on the Constitution. Uh, Labour have a sort of a flawed policy. I would say, on Brexit because they were a main party in a main country, but they have to tow the, the London line of we've that, left, yeah. the arguments are over. And I think that's the problem with being a, 
advocating for a unionist position, but not still not really being able to set your own policy. So, yes, there, there is a lot of overlap in policy. It's certainly more progressive than the Tories. So, yeah, Kevin's right. I think they'd make a, a much better opposition. I, I totally agree in that. And I think, you know, being tied to London too much has, you know, affected the Labour Party over the years and has been one of the, the biggest problems that they've had. Joanne Lamont famously quit because it was a branch office, she said. Yeah. And, you know, we've saw decision making be so different um, from London to, to, to Glasgow and, and Edinburgh. So it'll be interesting to see what Labour do. We've got Dark here, number one gaming, coming in to say big up the Northern Independence Party. We're going to chat about that later we because will. that's a by election that's coming up in Hartlepool. Yep. Hartlepool, it is, Hartlepool. yes. And again, on Labour, Labour don't look as if they're going to, you know, do well in this. And this is Keir Starmer's first test. Mm. And. Effectively, you know, in the first year, I think a lot of people have been let down by Keir Starmer as a whole. I mean, at first it looked positive and it just seemed to, to dwindle right out. Yeah, the Tories had a lockdown bounce. They were, I think, they were 55% at one time uh, when they were in lockdown. National crisis, back the government. Keir Starmer slowly began to rise and then there was a the Dominic Cummings scandal and they were sort of neck and neck up until about September, October time. Uh, and since then, it's... It's as if he doesn't really stand for anything. He, he's been criticising Boris Johnson, but not really offering an, an alternative. He, he's made a few blunders where he, he's kicked Jeremy Corbyn out of the party, then been forced to let him back in, but not restored the whip. So it's all very confusing. Uh, I think he's got several legal challenges, actually, the Labour Party. So that's going to be a drain in resources. Uh, membership has been slashed. They're trailing by anywhere from 4 to 11 points in the polls. You mentioned Hartlepool. Uh, I think there's been two uh, opinion polls for Hartlepool alone. I can't remember the, the lead the Tories had in the first one, but in the one out today, they had a 17-point lead. Obviously, that comes with a 1,000 people in one constituency. Yeah. You can't know for sure how accurate that is, but it certainly it doesn't look good. And you say the Northern Independence Party, they didn't actually get the candidate registered in time. So Thelma Walker standing as an independent, right. she's on 6%, but she will... Uh, be a, a member of the Northern Independence Party if she were to get into the House of Commons. Yeah, I think Hartlepool's going to be really interesting because what we've seen, especially in the, not just the past year, but the past couple of weeks with Boris Johnson, we've had his um, relationships come to the fore with James Dyson, we've saw dodgy PPE contacts with Matt Hancock, a bullying scandal with Pretty Patel. We have saw sleaze, 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 as Keir Starmer told it. But what was very interesting, what I found very interesting was that when Nicola Sturgeon was being um, put in the spotlight for breaking the ministerial code, Keir Starmer rightly said that if she had broken it, she should resign. Whereas it appears that Boris Johnson has mi misled the Commons, but no comment as such has came from Keir Starmer as of yet. Yeah, I don't think he's come out and said it. Um, I, I would assume he would call for his... Reg well, he, he, you don't know whether you can assume he, he's not called for anyone's res resignation yet, but you would assume that there would be an enormous amount of pressure on Boris Johnson uh, if he was to have broken the ministerial code. I think he said that he's going to have the final judgment. He's going to make the decision on the final report about whether he himself has broken the ministerial code. Uh, I mean, you could imagine the, the outcry from the Tories if Nicola Sturgeon had said that when she first referred herself two and a bit years ago. Yeah, I mean, the, the hypocrisy and the sleaze, it's been pointed out time after time over the last 11 years and still they're leading the polls. So, I mean, it shows you the flaws with, with the Labour Party, the union. Um, I think it's why so many people support independence. So, yeah, it's it should be very interesting. Certainly, I think it'll be a very bad result in the local elections. Certainly in the, the, the Midlands uh, mayoral elections, they look as if they're going to be having disasters all over the place, the Labour Party. I think Sadiq Khan over, won at a canter uh, in London. But um, he's got a lot, a lot of work to do. Uh, over the next three years before the next general election. And I think his first job should be to actually come up with some policies because mm -hmm. it doesn't appear to stand for much at the moment. No, it certainly doesn't. So you, you mentioned the word hypocrisy and we've got Hoggy Boys 1967 coming in saying, what about George Galloway telling you to vote Tory on your first vote with a, and a laughing face? Um, obviously a Celtic fan like yourselves. Um, George, I figure, I think that, I think as a Celtic fan, you, you, you've got kind of, you know, a shared value of politics and you would think so um, on the constitutional question maybe a bit split at times with people but I think certainly a Celtic fan p telling people to advocate for a Tory vote is a bit um, 
Yeah, but hypocritical. I think a lot of people would say in that one. Yeah, I think the only Celtic fans that would advocate for a Tory vote are uh, the board members uh, at the moment. Uh, obviously, not all of them. Uh, but no, I, I, a club founded uh, to feed the Irish poor in the East End of Glasgow, just set up to help people who are starving and desolate. To to advocate voting for the Conservative Party is it, it's pretty baffling. Actually, it's hard to understand and hard to comprehend. George Galloway, the socialist, who I think ever since he was kicked out of the Labour Party and went in Big Brother, the last eighteen or so years, he's he, he's gone down all sorts of it's anything to get himself in front of the cameras. Um, yeah, speechless to be honest about what he's advocating here, and yeah, a, a supposed socialist uh, advocating for. You know, there is a socialist argument for Brexit, but advocating for Brexit with Nigel Farage, there's a picture of him with Steve Bannon, vote Tory, save the union at all costs, even if it means Scotland is worse off. It, it's pretty unbelievable. Yeah, and somebody's he was saying there, it's shown his manifesto that a, a Tory or Labour first vote, basically vote for a unionist party first. Um, I've got Martin Davey coming in also, he's saying that he thinks the SNP will win out the park in this election. I've also got a comment coming in saying that if Labour had any sense, they would replace Keir Starmer with Andy Burnham on Friday morning. We should have taken that. I mean, especially, I think we, we saw the power of Andy Burnham um, when Manchester was being put back under COVID uh, restrictions and the money that he was wanting wasn't coming to them. Um, what do you think Andy Burnham would be like as a Labour leader? Yeah, I think it was uh, 66% they were offered and they wanted either 80 or 100%. And the famous two press conferences, yeah. uh, uh, the, the pictures and the, the videos. Um, I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, that there's obviously going to be a bit of a disaster for the Labour Party in the local elections. They'll probably blame, try and blame that on Corbyn. Uh, As they always do. Yes, uh, obviously. Uh, I think Corbyn actually done quite well when these local elections yeah. happened four or five years ago. But I think they'll try and blame it on him. Um, it, it's hard to tell how Keir Starmer will do because he's been up and down and it's as if he's at the mercy of events really he, he doesn't seem to be to be uh, changing events he, he doesn't seem to have a grip on things it's Keir's fault basically this yeah I, I think Andy Burnham would certainly be a more popular uh, yeah. Labour leader yep. certainly at the moment uh, but you know Keir Starmer I think looked like quite a sensible option for the Labour Party before he became the leader so it, it's almost like a poison chalice you just mm. don't know how they're going to do uh, when they're in charge I think I've seen something uh, although he's done very well as the mayor of Greater Manchester, I think he's he's very suspect on uh, homeless people in yeah, Manchester. Okay. I don't think he's I don't think he's doing what he should be doing or trying his hardest to, to house people. I think there's some issues with policing. I think policing's come under a lot of scrutiny over the last twelve months. Yeah, so he's by no means perfect. What politician is, but. Uh, I think he'd certainly be more popular. Whether he'd be doing better in elections, I don't know. We're going to now come on to party leaders. So if anybody's watching and wants to give us their thoughts on who they've been impressed with, who they've not been impressed with in these leaders' debates and uh, this election campaign. So we'll start off with First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. Um, again, running to be First Minister. It appears to be the only person that actually interested in being First Minister. How do you think she's handled herself not in this... Just not just in this election campaign, but the past year through COVID. Yeah, um, certainly uh, very impressive with the briefings and very much taking a hand on the situation. Uh, unlike Boris Johnson, who you know he was in hospital at the very beginning, can't can't be helped. But it, it he was sort of doing uh, one press conference a week, and they were happening every day in Downing Street. He it, it doesn't. He it didn't seem to have a handle in the situation. He let his advisor totally break the rules and just get away with it. Uh, that didn't happen with the Scottish government, obviously. The the CMO, Calderwood, yep. yeah, Catherine Calderwood was sacked within twenty four hours, I believe. As she should have been. Yes, hundred um, percent. So she certainly looked more impressive. You know, I think there's a lower death per million people in Scotland, but it, it's quite narrow. Mm. It's quite narrow. Uh, so yeah, very impressed with 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 the COVID handling. Very uh, strong strong image with the uh, the press conferences, uh, in the campaign. It's it's obviously been a very social media focused campaign. You can't go out, you can't talk to people, can't knock on doors, you can't go to debates. The debates are uh, very inferior, I would say, without an audience. 100%. I think the BBC tried to do a a virtual audience, and it just it, it didn't really work. And 
I think I've actually been uh, quite impressed with Anna Sawar and uh, the, the Green Co leaders, Lorna, who was on the podcast in Patrick Harvey. Uh, Willie Venny, he, he, he finds it very difficult to break through. Ten years as leader, and I think he struggles to get a, a word in or a policy in. And Douglas Ross tends to sort of embarrass himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yes, um, very impressed. It's it's a case of sort of uh, uh, not having a disaster because of how well she's doing in the polls. Uh, and I don't think she's had that. And with only two or three days to go now, she looks dead set to win at least a, a very comfortable minority. One of the, uh, our previous guests, Neil Finlay, criticised the First Minister for the, the government's handling of care homes. Rightly so. Um, why do you think the people of Scotland still trust her on everything? Even though in that area, certainly, you know, the government arguably had a disaster. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, I don't think they see the, the Conservative Party as a party of of government. Mm. Uh, they, they've definitely got a ceiling of about 30% max, I think, the, the Tories now. And I don't think you can you can govern a country in 30% as much as uh, as much as you the, the Tories would uh, would try. Um I think it comes down to independence to be honest. Uh, I think Labour actually have a point in a way where independence is a dominant issue. Uh, people vote how how they see the independence divide. I think if Labour took a, a softer stance on independence or, or even in, in favour of it, you could see a very uh, drastic dynamic shift in the polls. But as it stands, they're a, sort of, they're a unionist party led by a millionaire and in all the big issues, London decides the policies. Mm. So despite the disaster of the care homes, uh, People still trust the SNP to go on with the job, lead the recovery and grant us another referendum. Yeah, I think on Nicola Sturgeon, um, you know, she's been the face of this past year. She's put herself up there, whether you like her or not. I think even other party leaders would say that they've, um, you know, would, would kind of nod their, their, their head to her for that because she, she's been out there every day. She's led the, the charge against COVID, um, you know, with criticism, which, you know, as government is right to do so, but... I think the Scottish people do trust her. I think she's a very likeable figure, as the polls show, and that she will do well in this election. Um, so, from the club, we'll go to our opposition, um, Douglas Ross, who we, t- we touched on very lightly earlier on. We'd mentioned earlier on that it was a hard act to follow in Ruth Davidson for him, and whether or not he would still be Conservative leader. How, how do you think he's fared so far? Um, of saw him in, in TV debates where he's not been too busy being a linesman, of course. We know some teams that Douglas needs to put his football duties before his political duties to, to represent the people of Murray. So how do you think he's got on so far? Um, pretty poorly, but I suppose he, he's, he's starting from a, a, a losing position. He's got his base of about 15 or 20%. Uh, 70% of the country won't vote Tory anyway. So it's... It's the it's fine margins for the Conservatives are trying to win over unionists who, you know, might tactically vote to stop a referendum. As time goes on, that coalition will will diminish because so many people support independence. They're, they're definitely fighting a losing battle. Obviously, Scotland has voted for centre-left parties since 1955. So it, it really is a struggle for the Conservatives. Ruth Davidson, obviously, they peaked under her. Uh, so I, I, as I said earlier, I can only see them going backwards. And in some of the debates, Douglas Ross has been quite comical, if anything. Yeah, it has been comical. Um, that obviously that wee video last week, you just can't do that. Calling him, I've seen him even having a wee impression of Atomic Kitten, which uh, the song I used to quite like as a Stuart Armstrong song. I've been uh, <laughs> having nightmares about that ever since. So um, Doogie Doogie, don't know how he's going to get on. I don't think he'll do well at all. Um, don't know where he'll go after that. Probably be. Uh, running the line at a game um, so comment as a compliment coming in here for you by the way from Louise Spaulding who said that Patrick definitely knows his stuff he sure does <laughs> thank you Louise. not just in politics I should also pick you up on that a, a uh, few other um, subjects that he puts me to shame with but uh, <laughs> yes. he certainly does know his stuff Atomic Kitten was uh, Michael Lustig of course not Stuart Armstrong oh, sorry <laughs> that was an all game apologies <laughs> apologies Atomic Kitten was Michael Lustig yes. um, and completely ruined now isn't it after he had you yeah, know, I mean, when you see me uh, walking down the street, I know I'll, I'll only ever be able to think of Douglas Ross. Um, yeah, it's it ruined, 
Weird. So from Atomic Kitten on to uh, Bruno Mars, a.k.a. Anna Sabar, doing his shaking his shammies. Yes, he's got, he certainly did have the moves. Um, we, we touched on Anas earlier. Kevin came in with a, a comment about Anas. I think he's did well. I really do think he's did well. And I think he's did well in the debates. I, I wasn't too sure. If I was a Labour voter, I would have probably have advocated for Monica Lennon. I think she's she did well, especially with the girls and, and pushing through the... The, the period poverty bill and, and introducing free sanitary products for women, but I actually do think Anas has did well. Yeah, I mean, uh, there obviously is the, the new leader bounce. I don't think Jackson Carlow or Douglas Ross got that new leader bounce. Uh, Richard Leonard, if I remember correctly, was polling in the sort of low to mid 20s. Uh, there was a famous tweet saying that uh, give it a year and uh, Labour will be leading in the polls back in 2017. Uh, from a, a, a sort of a Labour commentator in London, it shows they should uh, pay more, pay more interest to Scottish politics when they're commenting on it. He's definitely got a new leader bounce. Unfortunately for him, that hasn't shown up in the polls. They're sort of, uh, they're just below the Tories. Sometimes an eighteen percent, twenty one percent, twenty percent. So it's not really reflected in the in the party polling. His personal ratings are obviously through the roof compared to Richard yeah, Leonard, who after. I think three and a half years as leader, nobody knew who he was. No. So, you know, a, a nice man, no doubt, but was not a leader and was not a great communicator. No. But again, Richard Lennon, he did have the backing of the unions and many people would say that the, the person in charge of Labour, you know, should have that backing. But I think you're spot on that as a leader, even in terms of challenging the First Minister, I thought personally it was very poor at doing so. Um, but we'll move on from him to, to Patrick Harvey. Uh, but in my opinion, the Greens again have did very well. I think he's a very strong leader. He's a very good, fresh bit of energy to the Parliament. He always comes across very well on topics that aren't always discussed. Um, but again, the Greens, uh, two co-leaders, we've had one, Lorna Slater, in the podcast. How do you think the two have done? Because obviously they've not always been on debates. Um, been, so the two of them. Well, I think actually, although they are co-leaders, you've obviously seen uh, Patrick the last sort of 10, 12 years. Uh, you say he's a, he's a, he brings a different energy at the Scottish Parliament. He's actually been there since 2003, which shows you yeah. how much the sort of main three parties, the SNP, Labour, Tory, have dominated, where even though he's been there for such a long time, he still feels quite fresh. He yeah. brings new ideas all the time. 100%. He's very up-to-date in, in what he thinks. He's got modern policies. Uh, but I think Lorna has actually dominated the campaign. I've personally seen more of her. Uh, on the campaign trail online obviously all the election stuff is online but you know Patrick very impressive knows his stuff and well trained with his uh, 18 years in, in politics 100% and we touched on earlier that we, both of us think the Greens will do well in this election mm -hmm. as they did in the last election and with the Greens doing so well it means another party doesn't do well and Kevin came came in with a comment saying leaders oh right there find it. Is this know. Willie? Leaders Willie Rennie, he said, what is the point? <laughs> if you for the Lib Dems, they need to get rid of, I think they sure do, Kev. Patrick, what's your take on that? Do they need to get rid of Willie Oh, Rennie? I would love Willie Rennie to stay around forever just for the photo shoots that he does <laughs> in election campaigns. It's absolutely hilarious. It is. Uh, I, I think Willie Rennie seems like quite a nice guy, but I mean, they have literally stood still in the 10 years he's been leader. It's actually quite impressive when you think about it, standing still. Um, don't quote me on this, but I think if they go from they've won five seats just now, I think if they go down to four, they don't even qualify as a as a party group. Right. They're just four Lib Dem MSPs, and that would mean that he doesn't get his his two questions at first minister questions. So it, it's hard to see where the Liberal Democrats go. Obviously, they got between I think it's something like seventeen, eighteen percent up until that. the coalition, yep. Yep. and I think people assumed after the coalition that. A lot of that would go to the, the, the Labour Party. But then, of course, you have the independence referendum and the Labour Party goes to the SNP. So the SNP have benefited from the collapse of the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party. So although they've both collapsed and their vote has gone into the SNP, you would assume, it's actually the Tories who are now the main opposition. So it shows you the the funny ways in which politics can work sometimes. Oh, definitely. Um on that, we've got lots of comments coming in. Thanks for everybody that's joining in the discussion. Um, where are we? Yep, 15 years Rennie has held him captive. Somebody says, hey, Daniel, um, do you think he has? Do you think he's holding the party back? Or do you think it's the damage that, that was done in that coalition that's held, holding the party back and it's still, you know, that they're still 
feeling the 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 impact of that right to this day? Well, um, obviously the coalition they suffered massive losses. Uh, Nick Clegg was quite lucky to hold his seat in 2015, lost it in 2017, got a, a, a comfy wee job with Facebook now, uh, over in America. Uh, very fortunate. Um, I think under Joe Swinson and with Brexit, they went from 8% to just under 12%. Mm-hmm. And obviously I think they've got four MPs in Scotland, I think I'm right in saying. So they capitalised on the anti-Brexit stance because Scotland had such a big Remain vote. Uh, but now that Ed Davies came out and said that we don't want to rejoin the EU, that these are old arguments, just like Keir Starmer, it's hard to actually understand what their message is. You know, they were for a second referendum, that's now over. They don't want a second Scottish referendum because they know they'll lose it. They sort of stand in the middle, they're, they're not really advocating for anything. I think it's the same with the Labour Party. They've been through... Well, they haven't been through so many leaders, but the Labour Party have been through so many leaders but held the same policy positions and they keep going backwards and they think a change of leader might help. I think the Lib Dems could actually be the opposite. Maybe a change of leader could help. But I think they need to have some standout policies because their anti-Brexit stance was the main issue and they don't have that anymore. Mm. I've got a comment coming in here saying that independence is a diversion. The issues facing working people in the UK are class issues, not issues of what side of a kid in the border you live. What would be your response to that, Patrick? I don't think class solidarity are confined to the borders of the United Kingdom. I think you can still have class solidarity with working class people in Manchester without actually being in the same country. In a voluntary union? Yes, I think Manchester would... uh, I don't know if they would jump at the chance to escape from Westminster rule. I think Liverpool probably would. I think Newcastle would mm-hmm. consider it. Uh, I think they would certainly give it a give it a, a thought because I don't think they're too keen uh, eternal Tory rule either. Uh, but yeah, class solidarity doesn't doesn't stop at the border. You know, the Labour Party. Will t- I think I am. I'm assuming he's he's a Labour supporter. The Labour Party advocate for international solidarity. You've got Labour parties in Australia, New Zealand. You've got a Labour movement in America. In America, you've got a Labour Party in Ireland, obviously struggling. Uh, you've got the Workers Party in Brazil. So uh, the Social Democrats in Germany. So working class solidarity does not end at the border. An independent Scotland would, in my view, be in a, a totally progressive, internationalist, positive force in the world, leading the way on climate change, being a left of centre uh, country. Uh, so, I, yeah, I think we could we could sort of show England what is possible mm-hmm. if we were to go independent. Uh, we should we could certainly show, you know, Tories. You, you don't have to accept the supposed fiscal responsibility that they advocate. You can actually. So I invest in the public sector, expand the public sector, and yeah, I think uh, the Labour Party might actually thrive if Scotland were to go independent. We've got another comment coming in here saying it's simple. Independence will be decided by the undecided voters and those that don't normally vote. Offer Scots EU membership, then job done. It would be so interesting starting away in here of how many people are registered to vote. It's a record, isn't it, for this election? It's, I think it's, I've got it in front of me, two, uh, four million and 280,000 are registered and 23% have got a postal vote. Um, I, I don't know if independence in Europe is locked in because I think the SNP have been advocating for that for, oh, if not 30 years, just under 30 years. And that is basically their position now and it's still 50-50 in the polls. I would hope that if there was a referendum, personally, I would like yes to be quite a few points ahead, like they were sort of last last summer, last autumn, uh, you've obviously got in every poll 7 or 8% undecided. They they can be very influential. But uh, I, d- I don't think... I mean, I, I would have voted Remain if I was old enough, but trying to rejoin the EU, there's there's no doubt about it, it would be quite difficult. Yes. So I, I don't think it's a, it's an easy win for uh, the, the yes side just to be pro-Europe. No, Bill, got a comment coming in from John Paul Connors. Saying that voting to leave the UK to join the EU is the least logical move ever. Can't comprehend this logic at all. Every argument for leaving the UK applies to staying out of the EU. Do you think that's a view of quite a lot of Scots? What about is the point in breaking up one union to go and rejoin another? I, I can understand the point. I mean, I think Jim Sillers talks about why why gain sovereignty, sovereignty and immediately hand it back. Obviously, you've got a lot more sovereignty if you're an independent country in the European Union. 
Um, yeah, with regards to the EU, uh, you're you're leaving a market of I think sixty two million people, and then joining a market of four hundred and forty million people. Yep. Whereas with Brexit, you're leaving a market of five hundred million to allegedly trade with the world, but. You are already trading with the world as a member of the EU. You're just not in full control of the negotiating terms. So I don't think it's the same. I think it's quite different. I can understand his point of view, but I don't think it's the same. Yeah, we've got a comment coming in saying staying in the EU opens Scotland back up to a market of 400 million. Mm -hmm, Customers mm -hmm. have been more competitive than England. Um, a lot of comments coming in as well. Well, we are at a, a, a trade uh, disadvantage, a, a a competitive disadvantage with Northern Ireland to, you know, Michael Gove actually said that they've got the best of both worlds as being a member of the UK and the EU. This is a guy who wanted to leave the European Union, saying that they have the best of both worlds. Obviously, I disagree. I think Scotland should be independent. But we're at a competitive disadvantage with uh, Northern Ireland. We would be at a competitive advantage, in my opinion, if we were outside the UK and in the EU, as businesses would want to, want to set up headquarters to trade with uh, British customers and also European customers. Yeah, I think, I don't think if Scotland was to leave the UK, that, you know, it'd be doomsday and we wouldn't trade with England, you know, it still would happen. No, the, lo the, the world happen. wouldn't end. It wouldn't end. Um, we've got some more comments coming in, um, saying what you see in the UK today is a result of Labour's abdomen of their core support. The SNP have filled that vacuum in Scotland with the illusion of being an inclusive and progressive party. Do you think it's just been an illusion or do you think they have been progressive in terms of um, their comparison to Labour in the past 14 years of government? Well, I'd like to know where he's coming from on that because obviously you could have, um, you could say a member of the Green Party might say they're not doing enough on, on trans rights, the, the Gender Recognition Act. It's been sort of can kick down the road, they would say. You could, you might, he might be a Corbyn supporter saying that they've not done enough on the economic side of things. Um, I don't know what a Tory argument would be. The the SNP aren't progressive enough. I can't see a Tory uh, advocating for that. But um, you know, they're they're not they're not sort of left wing socialists. They're they're moderate centre left party. They're, they're trying to win over fifty percent of Scotland so that over fifty percent will vote for independence. Um, and I think it's been relatively successful so far. Yeah, um, we've not got a lot of time left, so we'll have a wee quick chat about how we see this playing out, mm -hmm, where the mm -hmm. key battleground areas are. So if you want to tell the listeners where you think this election, we're going to get a picture of what the Parliament's going to be like come Friday. Again, we said at the top of the show that due to COVID, that the election won't be done in its traditional way. We won't be staying up on Thursday night, drinking lots of coffee and eating cheese and biscuits it will <laughs> be um, Friday afternoon probably when we start to get results where do you think the key battleground areas are where do you think the election could be won and where could it be lost well cheese and biscuits for on election night that's quite a, a middle class election night that sounds to me Declan no but no uh, <laughs> that's the buffy <laughs> oh oh I in the count uh, yes oh, there right, is okay. some very good count places oh. that have very good buffies and there is it's, nothing it's, better <laughs> by the way than comparing the sandwiches with your electoral opponents. All oh, right. Well, I, I never knew that. Yes, I, I've so never there, been to there is sometimes cheese and biscuits, but there's usually sandwiches. It's always biscuits, but um, yeah, plenty of coffee. That's usually the the yeah. Main that, I think that's a, a necessity. Um, yeah. Uh, so you've got you've got seventy three constituency seats that are won on first past the post, and you've got the fifty six regional list seats. The regional list seats will obviously be probably Saturday night, uh, but I think the the majority of the constituency seats will be on the Friday throughout the day and you've got some very very key results on the Friday you've got Edinburgh Central which with Davidson's seat she, she's standing down Angus Robertson is the SNP candidate it's actually a three way marginal Labour are up there you've got Eastwood which was a three way marginal last time Ken McIntosh presiding officer was at the Labour MSP there for 17 years lost his seat to Jackson Carlaw I can see that being another Tory SNP marginal Get East Lothian, that'll be Ian Gray standing down, Labour hold, SNP want to try and win that. Get Dumbarton with Jackie Bailey, 109 votes. Uh, Moray, which is uh, Douglas Ross's yep. uh, Westminster seat, was Angus Robertson. He's standing. They two seem to meet continually at elections. Edinburgh Southern, which I think I'm right in saying is Daniel Johnson. Yes, so that's correct. Th th those are the three Labour constituency seats. And, you know, I think if they lose them, the SNP could be on from a majority. I think Jackson Carlow actually has quite a, a strong majority in Eastwood. I think it's maybe 3, 4, 5%. But 
that would be a big gain for the SNP. Uh, so yeah, on Friday we'll have a very, very good idea of how not only the SNP are doing, but also the Labour Party and maybe the Conservatives as well. A few big hitters and big names in there and probably none other than, you know, what always seems to be the Labour leader and Jackie Bailey whenever they're in trouble. 109 votes. It's very, very tight there. Um, the SNP, of course, trying to take Dumbarton. Do you think Dumbarton could be a kind of Pennsylvania as we've seen last year, as in whatever Dumbarton goes with it could tell us the outcome of this election. I think we all probably know that the SNP will win this election, mm -hmm. but whether or not it's going to be an SNP majority or not. Well, the polls would have to be spectacularly wrong for the SNP to get, say, less than 60 seats. Yes. Um, I don't know if Dumbarton will be a Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was the one that took it over the line. Yep. I don't think that will happen on the Friday. I nope. don't think they'll get 65 on the Friday. I think there's only going to be 47-odd declarations. But... If they win Dumbarton and win it by some margin, it will be a very good indicator of how the SNP are doing, unless it is, of course, a flaw. But if that's repeated across across the board, eh, obviously Jackie Bailey will get in, in the list. A lot of the Labour candidates will. But yeah, if they if they have strong results, if they take the seats firstly, and if they have strong results, it will be it will be a great indicator of how the SNP will be doing. We're going to go on to our predictions. Um, to our listeners that are tuning in, please tell us how you think uh, the parties will get on, who's going to win the election, who's going to be the biggest loser of the election. I'm usually rubbish at this when it comes to football, so I'll try and be a wee bit better politically wise, but as a disaster in the US elections predicting states, um, me thinking that Florida was all of a sudden going to become uh, Democrats was completely wrong. Um, so, predictions. Do you think, first of all, the SNP will win a majority? Oh, I think there's a it's probably an outside chance just now, but I think I think they will. Um, it, it it's hard to judge. Obviously, the polls when you take the polls and you do a, a an overall swing, a, a a net swing sort of thing, when you don't take individual constituencies into account, some of them are predicting not a major a minority, some are predicting a majority. But I think the way they're polling on the constituencies, I I actually find it quite hard to believe that. You know, there would have to be a few short results for them not to win 65 seats out of 73. Turn up and vote. Yeah, obviously, I mean, the fact that people are registering and 23% of 4 million people have got a postal ballot, you would think that the turnout would be quite yeah, decent. I think it will. Uh, so I think if the turnout is quite high, the SNP would benefit from that. Yeah. Um, so yes, in the short hand, I do think the SNP will win a majority. Opposition. Tories are Labour. Who's going to come Trumps? Do you think the Tories can hold on? Or can Labour give us a bit of a shock and become opposition? Just in the SNP, I better say, I am unsure and I'm going to stick with the SNP in a minority government. I don't know if they will have enough to get them over the line. Um, you know, on the constituency seats, they'll do well, obviously. They'll, they'll get over 60, but I don't know if they'll get over the line. And if they do get over the line... I think it'll be very tight. It certainly won't be a, a landslide in constituency beats, which really are going to decide whether or not it'll be a minority or majority government. So back to what I was asking you there. Tories are Labour opposition, what do you think? Well, I should say, I'm going to say, uh, I think the SNP will get 67 seats. I think I'm going to make an official prediction. Uh, prediction 67 seats. Uh, I'm going to be really boring and say that the Tories... I'm going to spoil my predictions here and say every party will stay first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Okay. Uh, I think the Tories will stay in second. I think they'll make relatively big losses. I think they'll be sort of mid to low 20s, maybe 24, 25 seats. And with Labour, I think they'll make one or two losses and I think they'll be in about 21 seats yep. in third place. Um, so, got that. So, again, Labour still in third. In third place. I yes. think that's how it's going to pan out as well. I think that the, the clear divide in terms of the constitutional question with the Tories having a, a clear position as well as the SNP will dominate the election, as dominating the election in terms of the polls, I think the, the Tories will remain as opposition, not because of Douglas Ross, just no. due to the, the fact of their position. Um, so that's three of them. Party in fourth, was the Greens the last time? Mm -hmm. See that happening again? Definitely. Um, I think there was some outside, uh, sort of, there was a bit of chat of them finishing potentially third, because Labour were going backwards under Richard Leonard, it was... They get 9% of the European election, 18% of the general election, and you, you really didn't know how low they could go. And the Greens were sort of consistently polling in double figures. So 
There was some slight chat about them finishing third, but I can't see that. I can see them being double figures. The, the, the number 11 seems to be popping up every so often, so I'll go for 11 seats, them finishing fourth. Right, I'll agree with that. I think the Kings are going to do well. I think they've had a very strong campaign. I think climate is, you know, is a real dominating factor. Although we've got the constitutional question, we've got a COVID recovery. For me, the COVID recovery is locked in with climate, especially with COP26 coming to Glasgow. I think we can make real strides. We've obviously got Joe Biden signing back up to the Paris Climate Agreement. That's a positive step. The world needs to act now because time is running out. So I hope the Greens do well. And I think the Greens will give the SNP that government, whether or not it's a coalition, or we'll, we'll see. I don't think it will be. Um, again, I'm, I'm unsure whether the, the SNP will win a minority or a majority. But I think the Greens will do well. And... Um, I think the Greens have a very good chance of doing well in this election. Yeah, I mean, on the on the coalition, um, I think Lorna was quite keen to distance herself from that question. It, it's whether they, they've actually got it in the back of their heads. They, they might consider that. They might want to get their hands on power for the very first time in Scotland and the UK, I think. Uh, so I, I'm not entirely sure about a coalition, but I mean, there's almost certainly going to be an independence majority yep. in the Parliament. I mean, 100%. That, that's, a, that's a foregone conclusion 100%. almost. I, I think... Yeah, I think that is going to happen. It will be very interesting to see what happens. There's certainly going to be a lot to to talk about post-election um, on the state of politics. We've got some great guests lined up. Obviously, we've got episodes that we did before this. If you want to tune in, there's a lot of good content there and who I've spoken to from the Scottish National Party, from the Green Party and from the Labour Party, as well as a really great chat and insightful view uh, from Fraser Stewart from the University of Star Clyde. So there's a lot there. I think... All that I would want to say at the very end of this is please get out and vote on Thursday. Um, Definitely. The next five years are going to be imperative to the future of this country. Whatever side you're on of the divide, please get out and vote. Use your vote. Um, remember two different papers, Peach, Colour Ballot and... it's Peach and Purple. Peach and Purple. Um, as I said, you know, your first vote is basically who do you want to be your constituency MSP. The SNP are framing your second vote as who you want to be your party of government. But in many ways, as Patrick pointed out earlier in 2003, we saw that electing smaller parties to give them a greater voice in the Parliament. Mm -hmm. So some parties are standing on that. But please get out and vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no matter who the candidate is, who the party is, you know, you, you would encourage people to vote. I, d I don't think, actually, the Scottish Parliament elections have ever had more than 60% turnout. With so many people registering to vote and quite a large proportion of them using postal votes, I would, l I would hope that you could maybe break a turnout record. You've seen in America, you maybe thought with such a high number of COVID deaths, people maybe afraid to go out, that you might have seen a decrease in the, the turnout, but I think they had about an 8% increase or something like that. So hopefully we can repeat that here. And obviously massively important to the recovery, independence, uh, the climate, jobs, the economy. It's it's an incredibly important election and would encourage everyone to use their, use their two votes. Yep, it's an incredibly important election. We'll see how we get on. We both think the SNP is going to win, whether that will be right, whether that's minority, majority. We'll be back to discuss that on the State of Politics. Thank you for everybody who's tuned in to watch us live. And Patrick, thanks for joining me as always on the State of Politics. Thank you, Declan.